Okay, welcome back, everyone. I apologize for last week; I wasn't able to uh, to be here, but um, again, I'm glad to, to uh, continue now. So, just to recap for a few seconds of what we were doing uh, last time to get back into the flow. So, the topic that we were discussing, the topic we were discussing was the destiny of Kali Yisrael, the destiny of each individual Jew. Olam Haba, Tchias Mason, Mashiach. How do all these things? You know, how practically are these things going to happen, and what are the significance of these events? So last time we specifically were talking about the opinion of the Rambam and the opinion of all the Rishonim that follow in that world of uh, in that way of philosophy. And just uh, very quickly, what we what we said was is that in the view of the Rambam, the physical body and the whole physical world is really uh, th- th- there's nothing there's nothing more to the human body than just being a vehicle to function, to live, to move around, and so on. There's no there's nothing deep mystic deep uh, deeply mystical about it. There's nothing greatly you know, significant about the body. If anything, physical life in the body is nothing but a hindrance to the neshama. And therefore, in the Rambam's view, Olam Haba, which is the destiny of Kai, so which is the ultimate goal, says the Rambam, Olam Haba is when a, after a person passes away. After a person passes away and his body and soul separate, and the soul is then able to go back into Shemayim, into what we colloquially call Ganeidan, that's, that's Olam Haba. That's Olam Haba. That's what the neshama is longing for. That's what every Jew wants to happen. Uh, and the Rambam just explained that, the, and therefore, Tchias Mason in the Rambam's, in the Rambam's view is not the goal. That's not the destiny. That's not the purpose of creation to get all, to get the resurrection of the dead. The Rambam just clarified that the purpose of Tchias Mason is to allow those people that suffered during their lifetime, that were unable because of outside factors, to really accomplish what they needed to accomplish and to learn what they needed to learn and so on. So Hashem will give them a second life during the time period of Mashiach. Which is going to be a time period without without sickness, without any problems, without any issues of pranas and so on, to allow these people to to uh, accomplish and to fulfill their their uh, all their potential, and then they will pass away and they'll go into Olam Haba. They'll go into Olam Haba again. That is the perspective of the Rama. Um, just by the way, to clarify one thing, I remember last time someone asked whether or not the lifespan during that that second lifetime, according to the Rambam, is going to be very long, very short, and so on. So the truth is, I, I looked into it a little bit more. The Rambam writes in a letter that he sent out discussing this issue. In that letter, he throws in very, very quickly that he believes the lifespan during that time period will, generally speaking, be relatively long. Uh, there will be exceptions to the rule, obviously, but generally speaking, people will have a longer life uh, during that second lifetime of Chiyas and Mason, during the times of Mashiach. That is the, the, the world view of the Rambam. That's the perspective of the Rambam. However, so now what we're going to discuss now is the opinion of the Ramban. I say the Ramban, but the truth is it's the opinion of all the Mekubalim. All the Mekubalim, just the head of the Mekubalim, I guess you could say, is the Ramban. The opinion of the Ramban is as follows. He, he has a very, very big problem with the Rambam, a number of big problems. Uh, some, some of his questions, some of his problems in the Rambam are small, and others are very, very significant. Uh, one issue he raises with Rama, for example, is that we find in the Gemara many, many times the following nusa, the following, uh, you know, uh, uh, vernacular. So I'll say that after a certain person dies, for example, a certain tzaddik. So the nusa, the nusa in the Gemara very often is that this person is mezuman l'chai olam haba, is prepared to go to olam haba. So ask the Ramban, if a person passes away and and that's Olam Haba, what does it mean after the person dies, now you're prepared to go to Olam Haba? You're in Olam Haba, that's Olam Haba. So that, that's one, again, it's a small critique, but that's one problem he has on the Rambam. The other much more uh, significant problem that he has on the Rambam is the following. Even a very simplistic learning of Chumash in Parshish Bracious, we get the impression that if it wasn't for the sin, of Adam Rishon, if it wasn't for him eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he would have lived forever, right? There would have been, there's no such thing as death in the world. That's simply what it says in Chumash. Only because he sinned, is there such a thing as death? So I asked the Ramban a very, very fundamental question on the Rambam. If in the Rambam's view, Olam Haba means soul without body, right? And the body is nothing but a hindrance to the power of the Neshama, then how is it possible that if it wasn't for the sin, Adam would have lived forever? How would Adam have ever experienced Olam Haba? How would all of humanity have ever experienced Olam Haba if it wasn't for the sin? So says the Ramban, so it must be, it must be, therefore says the Ramban, and this is, and this is the approach that's been accepted by, by all the Mekubalim throughout all the generations. 
that the purpose of creation, the end, the end zone, the goal, the, the, the destiny of every single one of us and collectively the Jewish people is not soul without body, is not soul without body. The ultimate purpose of creation, the ultimate goal where we want to head is chiesam is the resurrection of the death. Soul and body united together in a perfected state, and, and, and in that state of soul and body together, an, with an unbelievable attachment to Hashem. Just to clarify, the Ramchal in his Sefer Derech Hashem talks about this at great, great length. And this, again, like I said, this is true by all the Mekabal and the Maral and the Sefer Kabbal and the this is, this, is, this is what they all hold is that the body, physical life, is not chas v'shalom. It's not a hindrance. It's not a hindrance to the neshama. It's not a hindrance to the neshama. The way it should be, the way it should be in the perfected state, in the world the way it should have been, before the sin and after the and mesim, is that the light of the neshama will be able to penetrate the body, and the body will become elevated, elevated to become one with the soul, and both then body and soul together will experience an attachment to Hashem that's greater than the soul could have experienced by itself. This is something that we're going to have to spend time a little bit more to understand how is it possible that, physical, that the physical body could somehow help the neshama in attaching, attaching itself to Hashem. But this is what the Mukhabalim say, that the body is not just a vehicle to allow movement, to allow uh, you know, uh, a person to get from point A to point B. The body is a mystical entity. Physical life has very great spiritual significance to it, and if it's and if it's uh, and if it's elevated properly, if the soul is able to penetrate the body in a proper, healthy way, then they both come together in unbelievable, unbelievable uh, unity, and the unbelie- and an unbelievable tzedakah Hashem. The example, by the way, that's given, and again, this is something I'm just we're going to have to work through this a little, a little bit later on. But the example that's given by the Balatan, he gave the following marshal. He said, let's say you have a person that wants to climb a mountain. So there's only your, the, the human being is limited with his physical body. There's only so much a man's legs can get him. So, but a horse, however, or a mule, is very, very strong physically. It's able to get to the top of the mountain. But the horse by itself is, is crazy. You know, it's completely untamed. It's wild. It can't, you can't, you know, it can't be controlled. So when the person trains the horse or trains the mule and harnesses the mule and rides the mule to the top of the mountain, so when the, when the human being and that animal come together, they're now able to accomplish something that each one of them on their own wasn't able to do. The person on his own, as great as the intellect and the superior knowledge of the person, he can't climb to the top of the mountain. And the animal could climb to the top of the mountain, but, it's, but it, when it's not controlled by the human being, it's completely, cha- uh, completely chaotic and completely wild. But when the two come together in perfect har- harmony, and the human being is able to control and harness the animal to be productive, then, when the, then the place that they can reach together is way beyond anywhere that each one of them could have gone by themselves. It says about time that's exactly the relationship between the body and the soul. It's true that the soul is an unbelievably spiritual being, but the level that it can reach in attachment to Hashem by itself is nowhere near the level it can reach in attachment to Hashem when it's able to harness and, and, in, and infuse the body with, with its holiness. That's, this is the opinion of the Mukabalm, and therefore, and therefore, the opinion of the Mukabalm is as follows. That after a person passes away, after a person passes away, and the body and soul are separated, the neshama goes, obviously without, without the body, the neshama goes to Shemaim in a place that's called Olam HaNesham, it's the world of souls. In common terms, we call this Ganeiden as well, but that this is a spiritual place called Olam HaNesham, it's the world of souls. And the neshama up there, despite the fact that it's attached to Hashem and it's learning and it's, you know, uh, like, like we find the Chazal concept of the Yeshiva Shemayla, there's a base Medrash in Shemayim and so on. The neshama is, is flying in heaven and, and it's unbelievably happy in heaven. However, the neshama is waiting and chalishing to the day where it's going to be able to come back down into this world after the resurrection of the dead and unite with that body, with that body, and now connect to Hashem in an unbelievably deep way. To explain this a little bit more, just to give a little bit, again, it's a very, very deep opinion. But what, before the sin of Adam Rishon, the body that, the, that Hashem made was able to come together with the Nisham in a very, very harmony, har, harmonious way, like, like I'm saying over here. Before the sin, the body was able to become uplifted by the Nisham to such an extent where they both together would have experienced an unbelievable attachment to Hashem. But because of the sin of Adam Rishon, because of the, the terrible, you know, downgrade that the entire planet went through by that sin. So the physical bodies that we have right now and the physical world that we have right now 
as great as many mitzvahs that a person can do and as holy as a person can become. But ultimately speaking, the Mukabalim say it's impossible for the body right now, in the physical state that we have right now, it's impossible for that body to become united with the Neshama to the extent that it could have been united before the sin. And therefore, this is why there's such a thing as death. The purpose of death is to separate the body and soul. The body goes into the ground and is broken down, and it's reconstituted when the time comes of Tchir Semes, and the body will be reconstituted in the form of other mission before the sin, in such a way where the soul will then be able to re-enter the body and will become united once again and, up, and uplifted to that level of other mission before the sin. So in other words, in the, world, in the perspective of the Mukubalan, the body is not something that's a hindrance to the neshama. It might be true that, the world, that in our lifetimes, with our Yetzirahs, with our difficulties, it, it feels that way. It feels that the body is something that holds the neshama back. And to a certain extent, it is true in our life. But however, say the Mukabalim, in the, in, in, in the destiny of Kal Yisrael, in the ultimate purpose of where we're going and where we're heading, the body is not a hindrance. The body is not a hindrance at all. The body is something that will, when it's perfected, when it's uplifted, when it's, re, when it's fixed by Tchiyas HaMesim, that body will become a vehicle to allow the Neshama to reach heights that it can't even imagine it could reach right now. That's what the Mukabalim say. So the process, the process of the human being is as follows. We're born into this lifetime with a body that's limited, with a body that's very, very coarse, with a Yitzhar that's very, very difficult, and we're limited with what our bodies can do right now. So we do mitzvahs, we do everything we can in order to strengthen our neshama, in order to build, you know, to build a spiritual reservoir for our neshama, and to, and to uplift the physical body as well a little bit. But ultimately speaking, a person passes away. And when a person passes away, the body that we have right now is broken down. It's broken down. And the neshama that we have goes into Shemayim, and it's, and it's attaching itself to Hashem, and it's waiting. And what it's waiting for is that day of Tchiyas HaMesim, which is going to be a time where Hashem is going to rebuild our bodies in that old way of other reason before the sin, of that way of the body being now able to become uplifted by the neshama in such an, to such an extent where now they could come together and, re, and, and, and reach heights that each one of them alone would not be able to reach. And that's what Tchiyas and Mesim is. And once that takes place, once the resurrection that takes place, that's forever. That's forever. And that's the purpose of creation. Until when the soul is disconnected from the body, that's not the Tachlis. That's not the purpose of creation. And the Neshama ultimately is waiting to come back down. It's waiting to come back down. And as much, as it, as, as much you know, spiritual uh, ecstasy it's experiencing up in Shemayim, it's waiting. It realizes in the depths of its soul, it realizes that it cannot reach what it can reach without the body. And it's waiting to come back down into this, into this world after the, after the resurrection of the dead. And that is the purpose of creation. That's, the, that's the, 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 the scenario of what we're happening. We go through this lifetime with a body that's very, very limited, very, very limited with what it can do and, what, and where it can take the neshama. Death comes and separates the body and soul. Body and soul. The body breaks down. And Tchiyas Mesa means that the, the body will be reconstituted and rebuilt in, that, in a new way, or really in an old way of other reason before the sin, to allow, to, in, 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 and, in it, and in that way, the body will become capable of uniting with the neshama to such an extent where they'll come together and, and elevate and become elevated to a level where the neshama it, well, is not able to do on its own. It's not able to do on its own, and that's chiyas and mason, and that is forever. That is absolutely forever. Um, now, by the way, just, just uh, one small thing on this side I just want to mention. Uh, until that time comes where the resurrection of that will happen, until our bodies are reconstituted and rebuilt in that superior, more refined way of other reason before the sin, and then the neshama will become imbued back into the body and they'll come together in an unbelievable level of attachment to Hashem beyond that which the neshama on its own could have done. Until that happens, as I mentioned, the neshama is, is in, is in Shemai, after death, right? Until the body is, is built. The neshama is in a place, again, the technical term for where it is, it is, it is held is called Olam HaNasham, the world of souls. Again, at the vernacular of our people, we call it Gan uh, But it's really, again, it's obviously a spiritual place. It's called Olam HaNasham. The truth is, the Ramchal writes this in a number of places, just a very interesting point. Ramchal says that there's really two things that's taking place in that, in that world of Olam HaNasham. Number one, it's just a place for the neshama to wait. Right? It's a place for the neshama to wait and to access uh, information about Hashem and to learn about Hashem and to delight in Hashem's presence. 
it's nothing more than just basically a holding cell, an exceedingly exalted holding cell, but it's a holding cell. Says Ramchal, however, that there's another aspect of what's taking place in the Ottoman Hashem. Ramchal writes that he gives an example of a person, let's say a person is very artistic. Let's say a person has a very strong artistic uh, talent. But for whatever reason in his lifetime, he was never given the ability of expressing that inner talent. So the Ramchal writes, such a person has a very strong tendency of becoming a bitter person. Not, not being allowed to express one's inner talents is not just the question, it, it's not just that, that the world is now missing an artist. The person himself uh, could become very bitter from such an experience. A person can become very, very uh, darkened by not being allowed to express himself. So says the Ramchal, every single one of us going through our lifetimes, because of our Yetzirahs, because of our issues in life, there's only, we, we only tap into the power of our Neshama to only a certain amount, of, uh, to, to a small extent. Our Neshama, throughout our lifetimes, is really being held back. It's not being allowed to really fully express itself. And says the Ramchal, the experience of the Neshama in Gan Eden, after death, or in the world of Oil Man Neshama, the world of souls, it's a therapeutic experience for the Neshama, because this is the first time, and it could be a very, very long time, where the Neshama is fully allowed to express itself. And that's something very therapeutic for the neshama, and it's very healthy for the neshama, because it could go through 80, 120 years of being held back, of not really being allowed or given the opportunity to really express all of its kaifas, of all of its talents, all, all of its dreams, and all of its yearning. And now, in the world of, of the neshama, in that world above, in Ganeidan, it's now fully able to express all the talents, and all the kaifas, and all the desires that it, that it had, and it was, that it was held back in this lifetime. And says the that's a very important step toward Tchiyas Mason, because just like the body has to be fixed, just like the body has to be reconstituted and rebuilt in a more refined way to allow it to become elevated, by the, to become one with the Neshama, so too the Neshama has to be healed from its, so to speak, psychological damage of being held back and not being allowed to express itself throughout its lifetime. And therefore, both body and soul during the time period of death are being fixed. The body is being fixed by being broken down and waiting to be reconstituted in a more refined way. And the soul in Gan Eden is being fixed by allowing itself to express itself, by allowing itself to discover, to rediscover its own nature. And that is a very, very important thing. So every single thing that, that a person goes through, again, in his lifetime and after the person's lifetime, it's all leading up to the ultimate goal, according to the Mekubalim, which is Tchiyas and Mason, the resurrection of the dead, which again, as I said, it's body and soul coming together and the body being in a much more refined way than it is today. And when they come together, where the, where the neshama, after experiencing, after expressing itself for so long in, in, in Gan Eden, and after the body being rebuilt in, you know, in a more refined way, when these two powers come together, then the level that they can reach together in attachment to Hashem is infinite, infinitely greater than they can, than they can reach each one apart. And that is the ultimate purpose of creation, to attach oneself to Hashem, body and soul united. Okay, so I guess we'll stop with this and welcome up for questions. Hey, I just unmuted everybody. If you want to come in with a question from the phone, please go ahead. If not, I have one Can I ask a question? Uh, Can I ask a question? Here. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question is, so, so far we learned the Ramban and the Rambam. Are there any other shitas? So the truth is there is a... Uh, generally speaking, this is how the opinions divide up between the Rambam and the Ramban or the Mekubalim and the philosophers. There is a little bit of an in-between shita, which is the, the opinion of the Ritva. The Ritva writes in a number of places, in Rosh Hashanah and other Mesechtas as well, that generally speaking, he view, he, his worldview is that of the Ramban. But he does agree that before the ultimate Tchiyas HaMesim, there's going to be sort of a mini Tchiyas HaMesim of the Ramban. So, he agree, so in, in other words, he also, he also feels that it's unfair, so to speak, for all those people that you know, experience difficult lifetimes, for them never to have a base of Mikdash. You know what I mean? Rashi never saw the base of Mikdash, and that's not fair. The Rambam never saw the base of Mikdash, and that's not right. So therefore, says the Ritva, even before the ultimate Tchiyas and Mason, which is, in the world of the Ramban, this unbelievably elevated spiritual existence, says the Ritva, there's going to be a miniature version of Tchiyas and Mason during the time period of Mashiach, which is just also very, very practical, just to allow all the tzaddikim and all those people that suffered in their lifetime to experience a happy and good life and to see Mashiach, to see the, the, the salvation of the Jewish people, to see the Beis HaMikdash. So that would be, I guess, sort of an in-between opinion. But generally speaking, this is, this is how uh, the two camps divide between the Rambam and the Ramban. 
And as I said, historically speaking, um, specifically, I give this something that we could talk about uh, really a whole other series of, of discussion of how philosophy and how Kabbalah, uh, how they interact with each other. But uh, generally speaking, Jewish people have definitely accepted upon themselves the philosophy, the perspective of Kabbalah. There's no question about it. And uh, this is something that uh, that the Jewish people really have accepted, the opinion of the Ramban and, and uh, all those that followed him in his perspective. Yeah, there's two okay. questions. I okay. don't know. I just, I'll use your mic because I don't want to shoot sure, that. Sure. Um, so one question is, first of all, how does the... How, how does the body differ the first time that the body, when the body comes back as opposed to the body that we, we, we're used to now? Yeah, how, yeah. Does that, how is that different? Right, so the, so the physical form of the body after the resurrection of the dead will still physically be the same, be the same makeup, meaning two arms, two legs, you know, two eyes, and so on. And the reason for that is because, as the Pusik says, the Selmalakim Baras Adam, that the human form is exceedingly significant. The human form is a very, uh, according to Kabbalah, every single limb of a human body is 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 uh, is related to something that's happening in the higher world. It's very very significant. So the form itself will be the same. The difference is going to be in the spiritual makeup of the body, how how refined the body is going to be. And I don't mean like you know Superman that the body is going to be indestructible. But again, this it, is something that's, that's difficult to really grasp people on our level. But uh, the, the difference is going to be more um, in the spiritual side of the body. That the body is going to be rebuilt in such a way where the physical makeup of the body is not going to hold back, not going to block the light of the neshama. Not only will it not block the light of the neshama, it will absorb the light of the neshama to such an extent where, they'll come, where the body and soul will become more of one entity than it is today. So that's really the difference between the two. And again, uh, this is something that we also discussed, that after the Chitz Mason starts, this refinement of the body doesn't stop, it's not finished. It's a process that will go on and on for all eternity. And the Mekabon do discuss what's going to happen in the year 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, and 10,000. They describe the differences that's going to happen, the refinement that's going to take place step year after year after year. But after the year 10,000, even the Mekabon say it's beyond their vision to really perceive what the world, will, what how, what level of refinement the body will experience after the year 10,000, but it goes on till infinity, because Hashem is infinite, and our ability to connect to Hashem, therefore, is, is infinite, but it's a question of refining the body more and more, of how, how much the body is able to absorb with the neshama, and how one with the neshama the body can become, but the form itself will be the same. So we'll, we'll look like what we look like. We'll look today. like what we look like, well, you know, yeah, 100%. You look like what you look like, but the whole world will be very different. The, phys the physical side of reality will be much more uh, in tune with spirituality. Yeah, and the other question was, and this might be a uh, separate shear, is according to the vision of the, of the Ramban and the Mukhaolim, how does Mashiach interplay and Chia yeah. Samedi? Because the yeah. Ramban, there was a very uh, specific... Uh, Interplay. How does yeah. that interplay? Yeah. So, like this. So, in the world of the Mukabalim, in the world of the Mukabalim, Mashiach is a very, very important step in this process towards Chesed. Because to go from a world that we have today, which is very, very physical and very coarse and full of impurity and full of problems, to go from that right away to this, you know, world of Chiyas and Mason, of the resurrection of the dead, where physical life itself is more spiritual uh, than 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 we can imagine. That's something that's very, very difficult to happen in a second. So Mashiach is a very, very important bridge between these two worlds of Olam Haza and Olam Haba. Um, and therefore, the Mukabalim do say that when Mashiach does come, again, how exactly Mashiach is going to come, like it should be today, right now we should find that very clearly, but how exactly Mashiach does come? Is it miracles? Is it natural? Uh, you know, what's the process of Mashiach? Again, that's something that, again, like W said, maybe that's something for another shear. But just generally speaking, Mashiach is that time period in the perspective of the Kabbalim as a bridge between this world and the next world, between Olam Haza and Tchiyas Uh And therefore, and again, the reason is because Mashiach is, is you know, having a Beis HaMikdash, having Mashiach, having, having the truth of Yiddishkeit become obvious to the entire planet, raises the world in a tremendous amount, in a tremendous way. And it, and it gears the world towards that time period of Tchiyas HaMesim. And that's what the Mekabon discussed. We have, even, even in Chazal, we find discussions about this. When will Tchiyas and Mason take place? According to some, it's after Mashiach comes, or it could, it could be 40 years after Mashiach comes. That's when the resurrection begins. Again, these things are not 100% set in stone. The Lashem, for example, writes in a number of places that these things are not set in stone. 
It even it, it, that it theoretically could happen in, in a second. But generally speaking, the perspective of what it seems by the Mukabalim is that we have this world. Mashiach comes to elevate the world a tremendous amount, and that acts as a bridge towards getting to the next level, the ultimate level, which is the resurrection of the dead. And, and again, when exactly will that happen? Is it 40 years later? And so on. That, that there are different opinions, but uh, you know, halavai, it should be very, very soon. Um, and again, also, by the way, just on the side, how Tchias Mason will also take place, again, maybe that's something we should discuss next time and so on. Um, we have to discuss also, is, are all Jewish people part of this? Is it possible for a Jew not to have Tchias Mason? You know, uh, is it possible to lose your portion in Olam Haba? Is that, is that possible as a Jew? The Gaim have a portion in this. These are all things that I guess uh, over the coming weeks we'll discuss. Okay, great. Thank you, and uh, sorry for the change of day. And we'll pick it up again uh, next week in Ritz Hashem. I'm uh, back on Wednesdays, okay? Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you very much. Be well. Dovi? So we-